to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. What does the scripture say? Romans chapter 4, verse number 3. As we think about today, the church's emphasis on the Bible. We want to encourage you to get your Bible and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study today. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study in the Word of God together. And we want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by individual Christians and members of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. They'd love to have you on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night. Whenever they gather together, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love His Word, and who are concerned about souls. And friend, if you'd like to study the Bible more, if you've got a Bible question, they'd be happy to sit down and discuss the Word of God with you. Friend, we also want to encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From our website, you can access a, a vast library of good Bible study material, whether that be video, audio, written material. We have it all on our website, and it's all free and available anytime. Just check it out, thegospelofchrist.com. And if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our past lessons, we've got lessons on every book of the Old and New Testament and on a wide variety of subjects, and they're all available free of charge. You can go to our website, fill out a media request form. You can either receive that as a digital download, or if you need a DVD or a CD, we'd be happy to send that to you free of charge. We'll even pay the shipping to get it there. And in our fast-paced world today, where people are so often using their uh, phones, won't you go to the available store and check out our mobile app, whether for the Android or Apple. We have a great app that you can get the gospel of Christ on in our busy world today. Let's now turn our attention to the Bible, the church's emphasis on the Bible. What makes the Lord's church unique? What makes it stand out in a world of denominational chaos? Friend, we emphasize and we insist that the Bible is the key to everything today. And so we want to mention today our emphasis on the Bible. And we're going to mention several areas that we emphasize as it relates to the Bible to show the unique and distinct nature of the Lord's church. Let's begin with this. The Lord's church, their emphasis on the Bible is based on an emphasis on Bible inspiration. That is, that this book, the Bible, is the very Word of Almighty God from His mouth and from His breath. Now, to show that to be true, I want to encourage you to open your Bible with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I want you to see for yourself the Bible's claim that it is from God. Look in 2 Timothy 3, Verses 16 and 17. The Bible says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. What makes the Lord's church unique? We, we emphasize that the Bible is from the very mouth of Almighty God. You know, when we think about inspiration, there are several other passages that help to show this idea from Scripture. 2 Peter 1, verses 19 through 21, Peter said, Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What's the driving force? Where did the, the words of Paul or John or Mark or Matthew, where did that come from? Well, they picked up pen. What was the force behind that? These men spoke 
as the Holy Spirit was the driving force behind them. Uh, Paul would say this. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, Paul would say, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things we write to you. These are the commandments of God. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Uh, God spoke through words, and those words are from the mouth of God. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13. And the Bible says all of it, all of Scripture is from God. Listen to Psalm 119. You know, sometimes people say, well, this passage here is, but I'm not sure about that. Listen to Psalm 119, verse 160. The entirety, how much? The entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And friend, we're emphasizing the Bible as being inspired of God. Because its truth is what saves. You can know the truth. And the truth will make you free. John 8, verse number 32. Romans 1, 16. The gospel is God's power to save men and women today. And so we want to emphasize that as God's sole revelation to mankind. Now, let's stop for just a moment and let's think about what we actually mean when we say or what the Bible means when it says inspiration. 2 Timothy 3, 16 again says... All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That Greek word for inspiration is a really big compound word, meaning that two Greek words have been combined into one. It is the Greek words theos for God and panoustos, which literally means to exhale. And so what does it mean when the Bible says all Scripture is inspired of God? All Scripture is literally god exhaled. The, the breath came out of God's mouth and on that breath was the words of the Bible. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Friend, when we say the Bible is inspired, not only are we saying it came from the breath and out of the mouth of God, we're also saying that it's full and that it's complete. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, God has given to us all things for life and godliness. John 16, verse 13, Jesus promised His disciples this. When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He'll guide you into all truth. Everything for life and godliness, all truth. Friend, the Bible, in and of itself, this is what's beautiful about the New Testament church. The Bible, we believe and we emphasize that the Bible and the Bible alone is God's complete Revelation for mankind, and it's everything we need for life and godliness. This book is verbally inspired, not thoughts, not ideas, not, not just a few bits and pieces here, and you've got to put the rest of the puzzle together. Here's how inspiration worked. 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, David said, His word, God's word, was on my tongue. Not in words which human wisdom speaks, but which the Holy Spirit speaks. God inspired the Bible in words, and God's Word was on those men's tongue. And friend, when we talk about Bible inspiration, let's realize the Bible says this is not a book of errors. James 1 verse 25, this is the perfect law of liberty. John chapter 17 verse 17, it is truth. This is God's final will and revelation, and thus we want to place a heavy, heavy emphasis on the inspiration of the Bible because it's God's message of salvation. Now, here's another reason the church places a heavy emphasis on the Bible. Not only is its emphasis on Bible inspiration, but the church places a heavy emphasis on Bible authority. That is, everything we do must be by God's authority. Would you take your New Testament and look with me to Colossians chapter 3 for just a moment? And I want you to see that the Bible teaches this idea. Look in Colossians chapter 3, and I want you to notice what the Scripture will say in verse number 17. Listen to Paul's words to the church in Colossae. 
The Bible says, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now friend, what does it mean to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus? Does that mean that I can just go out and do something, say in Jesus' name, and that makes it okay? Well, anytime we study a phrase in the Bible, it's always best to let the Bible be its own best commentary, right? Let me give you an example of Colossians 3.17 using this. In Acts chapter 4, verse 7, they said to Peter and John, By what power or by what name have you done these things? What does it mean to do something in someone's name according to the Bible? That you do it by their power or by their authority. Well, we understand that in everyday life. If a policeman is standing on a street corner, he steps out into the middle of the street, and he holds his hand up, and he says, Stop in the name of the law. Well, we realize he has the power, the authority to do that. Now let's translate that idea into Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do, well, what do you mean whatever I do? In word or in deed, do all. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Friend, I want to do everything in my life with God's stamp of approval. I want to have the authority, the blessing, and the permission of God to do the things that I do. And so when we emphasize Bible authority, we're saying that in our life, what we do, the way we talk, the way we act, the way we worship, must be approved by God in His Word. Isn't that what 2 Timothy 2.15 is teaching anyway? Study to show yourself approved unto God. How am I going to know I'm approved? By finding it and studying it in the Word of God where God's authority lies. Now, when we talk about emphasis on Bible authority, friend, let's also realize this. Bible authority means from the Scripture that we are not going to add to or take away from God's Word. I want you to open your Bible to Revelation chapter 22. This is such a powerful principle that needs to be driven home. Look in Revelation 22, and I want us to see that I have no, no man, I have no right, and no man has a right. If God puts it in there to take it out, or if God doesn't put it in there for me to put it in there, it won't work that way. Look in Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. Paul says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in the book. Is it okay to take it out if I don't like it? If it's not in there and I do want it, can I put it in? No. I don't get God's Word. Listen to this now. God's Word is not up for edit or revision. God's Word is settled forever, O Lord. Your Word's settled in heaven. Psalm 119, verse number 89. Now, friend, when we talk about Bible authority, let's also realize this. Bible authority means not only that we're not going to add to or take away, but that we are going to stay within the boundaries of God's Word and do what it says. Here's a passage I wish people could see today. Look in 1 Corinthians 4. If there's a passage that would make such a powerful impact today, it'd be 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6. Notice the powerful teaching here. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 6, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sake, don't miss this, that you may learn in us not to think beyond that which is written. Please hear me well today. There is a boundary. That is, there are markers on both sides. And I'm to stay within that. What is the boundary? Don't think beyond what's written. Somebody says, but you know, God, I know it's not in the Bible, but I'd like to have... Wait a minute now. Don't think beyond what's written. Well, the Bible doesn't say this, but that won't work. Don't think beyond what's written. 
Friend, if I want to be sure of my salvation, and I can be, 1 John 5, verse 13, the only way I can be sure is by doing what God says. And so the church's emphasis is on Bible inspiration. The church emphasizes the Bible because of its absolute authority. But friend, here's another beautiful reason we want to emphasize the Bible. We emphasize the Bible because of its marvelous message of God's love. Romans 5, verses 6 through 8 says this, While we were still without strength, in due time, or at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone might dare to die. Now listen to this. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What a beautiful message of God's love. When man was ugly, loveless, not in a state where he could be loved, in sin, and stabbing God in the back. What did God do? God demonstrated His own love by sending His Son. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. 1 John 3, verse number 1. And aren't you familiar with the beautiful words of John 3, 16? God so loved... Let's hear the depth of God's love. God so loved the world. He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And friend, when we say the love of God, please understand that also includes the love of Christ. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor that we, through His poverty, might be made rich. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse number 39. And friend, when I, when I hear those words about the love of God and the love of Christ, my mind immediately thinks about what Jesus did for me. He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 24. God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. And so the church puts a heavy emphasis on the Bible because of the marvelous message of God's love. Why else do we put a heavy emphasis on the Bible? We emphasize the Bible because the Bible's emphasis of forgiveness is such a powerful message that Every person needs today. One of the seven statements Jesus made from the cross is found in Matthew 27, verse 46. And it's just a question that Jesus asked. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You ever stopped and thought much about the answer to that? Why was God separated from His Son? Well, I'm the answer, and you're the answer. You see, sin is what separates a man from God. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, The Lord's ears not heavy that He cannot hear, His arms not short that He cannot save, but our sins and our iniquities have separated us from our God. God is a pure eyes that behold evil. He cannot look upon wickedness. Habakkuk 1, verses 12 and 13. And yet remember, He bore our sins in His body. 1 Peter 2, verse 24, God made Him who knew no sin to be sin. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Why? So that I could have, and so that you could have forgiveness. Do we really understand how powerful the Bible's message of forgiveness is? I want you to take your Old Testament and look at this beautiful passage with me. Would you turn to Psalm 103? I want you to read Psalm 103, verses 10 through 12 with me, as we think about the beauty of God's forgiveness. That's Psalm 103. I want you to look in verses 10 through 12 with me. The Bible says this, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. How powerful are the words of Psalm 103 verse 10. 
I didn't get. If I'm a Christian, I didn't get what I deserve for sin. He's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. If you, O oh Lord, were mark iniquities, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Psalm 103, verses 3 through 5. And, and listen to the words of Hebrews 8, verse 13. What do we mean by forgiveness? That they have com been completely removed and forgotten to be held against us no more. Why? Because God said this, I'll be merciful to their sins and their lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. Let's then think about a couple of other reasons the church places such a heavy emphasis on the Bible. We place a heavy emphasis on the Bible because the Bible's plan of salvation is what saves. You know, in our world today, uh, you could probably get a hundred different answers to the question of what must I do to be saved? Acts 16, verse 30 and 31. But friend, in all honesty, the only answer that matters is what does the Scripture say? Romans 4, verse 3. And friend, we want to put the emphasis on the Bible's plan of salvation. Not men and what they may tell you to do or what they may tell you to think or what prayer they may say you need to say. Let's ask the question, what does the Bible say about salvation? You know, when we turn to the Word of God, it is such a simple plan. Acts 18, 8. Many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. What does Jesus say I need to do in the Bible to be saved? Well, no doubt we've got to hear the message of salvation. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, verse 6, and... Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. And so when I turn my attention to the Bible, I can hear, and that produces faith. And the Bible says, Jesus says, I must believe to be saved. Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. Those are the words of Christ in John chapter 8. Verse number 24. And so once I've heard the message, the Bible says I've got to believe. The Lord said, one must repent. In Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, uh, certain people came to Jesus, and it looks like they're trying to make themselves look good and look down on other people. And they said to the Lord, Lord, what about these 18 people who are walking down the road, and out of nowhere a tower fell on them? Or what about these Galileans who Pilate mingled their blood with a sacrifice? Weren't they worse sinners than everybody else? And Jesus said in verse 3 and in verse 5, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. And so I've got to hear God's Word. I must believe Jesus said. Jesus said I must repent to be saved. I've got to make the good confession that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men... Neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven, but if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before the Father who is in heaven. And then, friend, listen carefully now. Jesus taught, not men. Jesus in the Bible teaches, you must be baptized to be saved. Listen to the clarity of Jesus' words in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verse 16. Jesus said this, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Friend, may I ask you, what did Jesus say you've got to do to be saved? Jesus did not say, He that believes will be saved. Jesus did not say, He that is baptized will be saved. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. The church wants to emphasize everything God says on salvation. Acts 2 verse 38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins. Peter said later in 1 Peter 3 verse 21, Baptism does now also save us. The Lord said in John 3 verse 5, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And it was Saul of Tarsus who was told, 
Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 22, verse number 16. And then, friend, we want to emphasize one last principle, and it's this. We want to emphasize from the Bible the joy of being a Christian. I want you to open your Bible to Philippians chapter 4 with me for just a moment. And I want you to see, we want the emphasis to be on the Bible because the Bible emphasizes how good it is to be a child of God. Look in Philippians chapter 4, and I want you to notice verse number 4. Look at what the Bible will say in Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'll say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We want our emphasis to be on the Bible because, friend, the Christian life is the best life and the most joyous life you could ever live. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. John chapter 10. And Christians truly can rejoice in the Lord always. Philippians 4 verse 4, And just as the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 1, Happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of ungodly, nor stands in the, seat, in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but happy is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. You want to find true peace, true happiness, true joy in this life? Friend, the only way we can do that is in Jesus Christ. And so today we hope that you have found it very encouraging to know that the Lord's church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, puts its emphasis on the Bible. If you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you to become one. If you'd like to study more or know more about the Lord's will, just contact us and let us know. We'd be happy to discuss that further with you, and we hope and pray you'll join us next time as we study more about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.